Byakuya Kuchiki belongs to one of the four great noble clans within the Soul Society. Upon his initial introduction into the series, we learn that he is the head of the Kuchiki clan, as well as being the first captain ranked Shinigami that we see within the story. From his initial introduction to the end of the Soul Society arc, we see a clear change within Byakuya's character. During the early portions of the story, Byakuya believes in law and order above everything else. The obvious reasons for this is that he is a captain within the Gotai 13, and of course he is the leader of a great noble family. But of Upon deeper inspection, this doesn't explain why Byakuya is so unwilling to break the rules, even if it costs him his sister's life. He is the first real threat that is presented to us within the story, and the character that Ichigo must overcome in order to save Rukia during the Soul Society arc. So in this video, I'm going to analyse Byakuya's character, as well as explaining the growth that his character undergoes from the beginning to the end of the series. So let's analyse how he transforms from a character who is so focused on the rules, and has difficulty expressing that he cares for his lieutenant Ren and even Rukia, compared to his character by the end of the series who clearly values the lives of his comrades and Rukia more than the rules and law and order. Byakuya first appears in chapter 51 of the manga and in episode 15 of the anime. His most distinctive feature is his long black hair and his grey eyes, as well as the white headpieces that he wears on his head, which symbolise that he is the head of the Kuchiki clan. He also wears a white scarf, which makes his captain's uniform more distinctive than the other captains. We learn that this scarf is indeed a family heirloom, which is passed down from generation to generation, as it is given to the head of the Kuchiki clan. In addition to coming from nobility, he is the captain of the 6th division. He is the type of person who is very stubborn in his beliefs and he doesn't care about other people's opinions. Like in chapter 99 when Momo and Kira find Renji's body after his battle with Ichigo. Momo volunteers to get Renji immediate medical attention, but Byakuya arrives and says that it isn't necessary. Instead, he tells them to throw Renji into a cell and to let him rot there. The reason for this is that Renji went to fight Ichigo on his own, and the only outcome that Byakuya was willing to accept was if Renji defeated Ichigo. That of course wasn't the case. Because Renji was defeated, Byakuya refers to his own lieutenant as a fool. He completely disregards Momo's suggestion of getting Renji medical help, and he further ridicules his lieutenant by telling Momo and Kira to get this beaten fool out of his sight. Byakuya's appearances after the Soul Society arc are such a contrast to this early version of himself. After his battle with Ichigo, we do see a drastic change in Byakuya's character and his attitude. The most notable change is the way that he interacts with his underlings. He is more empathetic and caring towards them. Earlier on, Byakuya's pride was very self-centred, whether if it was pride in his own strength and power, or pride in his status and his nobility. Even in chapter 162, Ichigo asks Byakuya if his pride has anything to do with allowing Rukia's execution to go ahead. It does appear to be true, as Byakuya's pride has been affected by Rukia breaking the rules. After all, it was him who adopted Rukia and brought her into nobility. His decision to adopt someone from the slums is being called into question. This is of course hurting his pride. The only way that he can hold his head up high and keep his pride intact is if he goes along with Rukia's execution. After his battle with Ichigo, Ago, Byakuya's pride is no longer about himself. Instead, his subordinates become an extension of his own pride, and this is seen firsthand in chapter 302. During his battle with Zomari, Byakuya makes a distinction which helps to clarify his motive behind killing the Espada. He says that he doesn't intend to defeat him because he is fulfilling his duties as a Shinigami, but instead he is going to defeat him because Zomari pointed his sword at Byakuya's pride, and obviously he is referring to Rukia as his pride in this moment. This one encounter shows the stark difference between Byakuya during the Soul Society arc and his subsequent appearances, and it's fascinating how Kubo can write a character to be so dislikable in one arc, but then reform his character to easily make him one of the most beloved characters to feature within Bleach. From the time that Rukia was adopted into the Kuchiki family until her death sentence, Byakuya's personality and mannerisms made Rukia believe that he didn't care about her. Her feelings of not being cared about are further reinforced, when you learn that Byakuya didn't look in her direction once after she was adopted. Despite how he may outwardly appear to others, Byakuya still cares for and protects those who are close to him. Before I discuss what causes a change in Byakuya's character and his beliefs of law and order, we need to first try to understand how these beliefs were formed. From the few scattered pieces of information that we learn about Byakuya's past, I'm going to first go over all of the history that we learn before his first appearance in the anime. The earliest chronological appearance of Byakuya occurs during the Turn Back the Pendulum arc. We are introduced to a teenage version of Byakuya who is training endlessly in the presence of his grandfather. He is preparing to take over the leadership role of the Kuchiki family. On one such occasion, while he is training, he is visited by Yoroichi, who 
would often come and visit the Kuchki mansion. Even as a teenager, it appears that Byakuya still retains a lot of his personality. He appears to be focused with his training, duties and his responsibilities. He doesn't have time to entertain Yoroichi, who has taken advantage of Byakuya's nature to take life way too seriously. She tells him that she made the effort to come all of the way just so that they could play games together. He tells her, as the future head of the Kuchki family, he has no time to be playing games. It is a very playful encounter as Yoroichi steals the hair string that is holding Byakuya's hair in place. This playful little exchange is an excellent callback to the Soul Society arc, when Yoroichi arrives and stops Ichigo from fighting Byakuya prematurely. In chapter 118, when she tries to leave with Ichigo, Byakuya tells her that she cannot get away from him, but Yoroichi taunts him by referencing these playful encounters that we see during the Tenback the Pendulum arc, by asking him if Byakuya has ever beaten her in a game of tag before. Just like in the past, Yoroichi proves that her shampoo is faster than Byakuya's. Through Byakuya and Yoroichi conversing with each other so early on in the series, we learn that these two characters who both come from nobility had a shared history with each other. This brief encounter during the Soul Society arc is remembered by Kubo and is expanded upon during the Tenback the Pendulum arc. In my opinion, examples like this make the character interactions feel real and add depth to them. This next piece of information which I'm going to cover from Byakuya's past helps to explain why he was so opposed to breaking the rules of the Soul Society. We learned that 55 years ago from the present timeline, Byakuya married a woman called Hisana Kuchiki. She was the older sister of Rukia Kuchiki. Five years after their marriage, Hisana had fallen ill and was on her deathbed. Her final request to her husband was to find and adopt her younger sister who she had abandoned years ago. A year after Hisana had passed away, Byakuya located Rukia and had adopted her into the Kuchiki family. Byakuya broke the laws of his noble family by marrying a commoner from the Rukongai district. Despite the opposition of several of his family members, he insisted and married Hisana, and he had broken the rules once more by fulfilling the wish of his dying wife. By adopting Rukia into a noble family, he had broken the rules of the Kuchiki family once more. After he had taken Rukia in, he swore at the graves of his parents that he would never break the law and order of the Kuchiki family or the Soul Society from that moment on. To uphold the honour of his parents, he swore that from that moment on he would uphold the rules at whatever the cost. After making this oath to his parents, this causes Byakuya to be very conflicted. On one hand, there is his promise to his parents, which would cause him to uphold the law and order of the Soul Society by allowing Rukia's execution to go ahead. And on the other hand, there is his promise that he made to Hisana to protect her younger sister after her passing away. Throughout the Soul Society arc, we quickly learn that Byakuya has favoured honouring the oath that he made to his parents. But after his battle with Ichigo, he quickly learns the error of his ways. So now that we know enough about his past and the beliefs that he adopts before his first appearance in the series, let's analyse how he tries to justify Rukia's execution and has his mind ultimately changed by Ichigo. At the beginning of the series, he and his lieutenant Renji Abarai are tasked by the Soul Society to capture and return Rukia Kuchiki. During his introduction, we quickly see that he has a very silent yet overbearing demeanour. During Ichigo's battle with Renji, when he begins to have the upper hand against him, Byakuya interrupts by breaking Ichigo's Zanpakuto in half before he can deliver the final blow. Byakuya is the first captain ranked Shinigami that we see. Through how he swiftly takes down Ichigo, we see the level of difference between Ichigo's current state of power compared to a captain ranked to Shinigami. The two strikes that Byakuya delivers to Ichigo are enough to fatally wound him. And even if Ichigo were to survive, Byakuya intentionally striked Ichigo so that his powers would be no more. During this first encounter, he comes across as overly arrogant and even shameless in his later appearances during the Soul Society arc, as he appears to be perfectly fine with his sister being executed. At this early point in the story, the way that Byakuya uses his speed and power to swiftly take down Ichigo illustrates the wall of difference between the two of them. And if Ichigo is to indeed save Rukia, then he must overcome Byakuya, who seems like an impossible opponent to defeat right now. At the beginning of chapter 65, Byakuya informs Rukia that she is going to be executed for her crimes. This sentence shocks Renji as it appears to be far too severe for the crime that was committed, but in a very cold manner, Byakuya relays the information to Rukia and shows no remorse. He tells her that 25 days from now she is going to be executed, and that is the Soul Society's final decision. You would not be able to tell that Byakuya really cares about her through these early interactions as he says to her that he will not see her again until the day of the execution. Like I mentioned before, he is upholding the law and order of the Soul Society, and by doing so, he is honouring the oath that he made to his parents. Byakuya's heartlessness is further emphasised in chapter 134, when Captain Ukitake frantically arrives and informs Byakuya that Rukia's execution date has been moved up. The execution is now going to be taking place the next day, and it appears that Byakuya doesn't care in the slightest. Ukitake wants a response out of him, to show that he has some compassion for his 
younger sister, but he simply says that he accepts the decision to move the execution to tomorrow. He even refers to this as a trivial matter as he scolds Ukitake for troubling him with this. Understandably, Ukitake is frustrated by Byakuya's lack of concern. Doesn't the fact that Rukia is going to be executed mean anything to him? If we didn't know about his past and the oath that he made to his parents, it would be so confusing as to why he hasn't opposed this severe punishment for the crime that was committed. On top of this, Rukia's execution date is being moved sooner and sooner. All the while, Byakuya is not opposed to the decisions that are being made by the higher-ups in regards to his sister. He tells Ukitake that Rukia is none of his concern as she is a member of his family. Whether if she lives or dies, it's none of his business. On the morning of Rukia's execution in chapter 138, Byakuya is seen praying at the shrine of his wife. He is informed that the execution is about to commence. He says goodbye to the picture of his wife before making his way over to Sokyoku Hill. But before he arrives, he encounters Renji who has escaped from prison and has fought his way through several Shinigami in order to save Rukia. After learning that Renji intends to save Rukia, he tells him that he cannot. This encounter helps to show how dysfunctional the relationship that Byakuya shares with his own lieutenant. And this is simply because Byakuya holds his feelings too close to himself and he is not expressive at all. And this ultimately robs Byakuya from forming meaningful connections with the people that surround themselves around him. For the sake of saving Rukia, Renji summons the courage to oppose his own captain. It is revealed that Renji had dreamed of surpassing Byakuya long before he had joined the Gotai 13. He feels confident that he can now surpass him after having learnt Bankai. Byakuya expresses to Renji that he was unaware that he had attained Bankai. Renji's response reveals a lot about Byakuya's arrogant nature, as he says that how could Byakuya have noticed, since he pays no attention to anyone who he considers beneath him. During the Soul Society arc, he is far from humble, and his pride as a member of a noble family I think gets to his head. The consequences of Byakuya not being very expressive with his emotions impact Rukia and both Renji. Rukia is impacted through how she feels like she has no connection with her older brother, and Renji through how he is made to feel insignificant. No matter how much progress he makes, he will never earn the acknowledgement of Byakuya, his captain. Rukia and Renji obviously both respect Byakuya a great deal. There are several examples of Byakuya actively showing that he cares for for them after the Soul Society arc, but prior to Rukia's execution, Byakuya is like an emotionless brick. Even if it pains him to know that Rukia is going to be executed, he is not willing to do anything to oppose the law and order of the Soul Society and the decisions that they make. The frustration that we feel towards Rukia's older brother is channeled through the different characters who challenge Byakuya during this arc, whether if it was Ukitake earlier or Renji now. It is satisfying to see Byakuya's approval of Rukia's execution being challenged by so many different characters. Byakuya defeats Renji after determining that he is not ready to use his Bankai in battle. To show the overwhelming difference between their power, Byakuya activates his own Bankai and easily defeats Renji. At the end of this very brief battle with Renji, Byakuya proves that he has a superiority complex through the final words that he tells Renji before leaving for Sokyoku Hill. He tells them that a class difference exists between them. No matter how hard Renji will try, his fangs will never reach Byakuya. He uses an analogy to explain their difference in class, likening it to the tale of the monkey and the moon. In this example, the moon represents Byakuya and the monkey represents Renji. He says that the moonlight that is seen in the eyes of the monkey is not the actual moon, but rather the moon's reflection on the water. He says that Renji, just like the monkey, may desperately try to capture the moon, but he will always be out of reach and will instead sink to the bottom. And this poetically describes how Renji will always be beneath Byakuya. Before Aizen is introduced as the main antagonist of the series, Byakuya's mindset and his ideology is frustrating enough for us to want to see him be defeated. All of this talk about him being superior and how he looks down upon others and even classes them as being beneath him, it helps to build the anticipation for his final battle with Ichigo. All of these aspects of Byakuya's character are called into question while he's battling Ichigo, but prior to being defeated, he has some very toxic personality traits. I mean, the difference is, later on in the story, he directs these personality traits to his opponents, but during the Soul Society arc, he doesn't distinguish between friend or foe. I keep saying this, but it is vital to understand. Before her execution, he did not acknowledge Rukia once, and even with Renji, he made no effort to form a relationship with his lieutenant. We can try to understand this behaviour as being a consequence of his oath that he made to his parents. There is no easy way to explain him deeming others to be beneath him, especially his own comrades, but these flaws that exist within Byakuya's character are the basis for his fundamental mental growth, and the change which he undergoes which ultimately leads to him sacrificing himself and apologising to Rukia and Renji and leaving the rest to Ichigo during the Thousand Year Blood War arc, but I will talk about this more later. 
I want to now go over Byakuya's highly anticipated rematch with Ichigo, and how it serves to reform his character. The battle between the two of them begins in chapter 152. After Ichigo effortlessly takes down three lieutenants, he is attacked by Byakuya. He asks Ichigo why is he insisting on trying to save Rukia, but he responds with a question of his own, wondering why Rukia's brother isn't trying to save her himself. Byakuya's resolve is not easily wavered, as he tells Ichigo there is nothing to discuss. The only option that he has left is to eliminate Ichigo himself and to kill Rukia by his own hand. The only thing standing in his way is Ichigo's opposing resolve. Ichigo desires to protect her and to prevent her death, and ultimately this rematch is a battle of two resolves. Ichigo resolves to break the rules in order to save the life of his friend, while Byakuya is trying to make an example out of Rukia. It's like he went from one extreme to the other. He opposed the rules in order to marry Hisana, and he opposed the rules when it came to adopting Rukia, but now he has so much conviction within law and order he is even willing to take it into his own hands. And this is especially true when you see him declare that he will kill Rukia himself, now that the Sokyoku is no longer functional. Byakuya has a lot of conviction in his resolve to enact the law and order of the Soul Society, but he is opposed by Ichigo who matches Byakuya's level of resolve. I've always thought of this battle as Ichigo slowly bringing out the emotion within Byakuya, allowing his character to open up a little bit so he's not concealing his emotions or hiding behind this belief that law and order is absolute. Let's now find out how Ichigo's resolve to save Rukia changes Byakuya's character for the better. From the very beginning of their battle, Byakuya says that he won't need to use his Bankai to defeat Ichigo. As well as this, he admits that Ichigo will never be able to change his mind. He has made up his mind that he is going to kill both Ichigo and Rukia. Both of their fates are sealed. Despite Byakuya's stubborn conviction in his own words, both of these statements are proven wrong by Ichigo, as he does eventually force Byakuya to use his Bankai, and in addition to this, Ichigo's death and Rukia's death are both prevented. The first time that we see visible shock on Byakuya's face is when he activates his Shikai, but Ichigo counters it with a Getsuka Tensho. He realises he is no longer the same boy who he he swiftly took down in the world of the living. Ichigo is more confident, and he has the strength and power to back up his resolve. After repeatedly taunting Byakuya to use his Bankai against him, he finally activates his Bankai Zenbon Zakura Kageyoshi. His Bankai attacks Ichigo from all directions, as he is overwhelmed by millions of blades. His Bankai is highly effective against Ichigo's Shikai. It leaves Ichigo really badly wounded as he's on his knees, but when he starts to hint that he has a Bankai of his own, it once again surprises Byakuya. Up until Ichigo activates his Bankai, Byakuya has been underestimating him. While he watches Ichigo activate his Bankai, Byakuya looks on puzzled. He is in disbelief, as he says it is impossible for Ichigo to have attained Bankai. His reasoning is that only the most experienced Shinigami can perform Bankai. Even within the four great noble families who are born with high spiritual pressure, one in several generations will only attain Bankai, and those who have attained this form are etched into the history of the Soul Society. He is once again left speechless, as he wonders how a ordinary human who had borrowed Shinigami powers could attain this legendary Bankai form. For all the Bankai that we have seen up until this point, they are all grandiose spectacles, but Ichigo's Bankai, despite visually looking cool, is very underwhelming, as even his sword has shrunk in size. Byakuya considers Ichigo's multiple actions as an insult to the honour of the Soul Society. Firstly, he disrespected the execution ceremony, and now he is disrespecting the concept of Bankai by challenging him with an ordinary Zanpakuto. Ichigo tells him that it is because of Byakuya's honour that he is insisting on killing Rukia, and he says that it was for this reason that he decided to step on Byakuya's honour, and it was the driving factor which caused him to attain Bankai. Indeed, after transforming, Ichigo's speed surprises Byakuya. It is an excellent contrast to the speed that Byakuya used to take down Ichigo early on in the series. The speed of Ichigo's Bankai is making it difficult for Byakuya to keep up with him. In chapter 163, Ichigo finally repays the favour and appears behind Byakuya, surprising him, and he pierces him from behind. The Battle of Two Resolves continues as Byakuya activates an ability called Senke. It surrounds the two of them with thousands of columns of blades. This is an ability that Byakuya reserves to use against those who he has decided to kill by his own hand. In chapter 165, the tide of battle turns in Byakuya's favour. As Ichigo starts to slow down, Byakuya even tells him that it appears that he has reached his limit. He is impressed by the progress that Ichigo has made. He says that he defeated Captain Class Lieutenants. He survived a attack from Zenbon Zakura, and ultimately he did well to last this long against Byakuya. Just as Byakuya is about to deliver the final strike to defeat Ichigo, his hollow takes over his body, and I'm starting to now lose count of the number of times that Ichigo shocks Byakuya, as his involuntary transformation startles him. After his hollow takes over, he strikes Byakuya across his body. The speed, ferocity, and the way that he is utilising Ichigo's Bankai is overwhelming. When Ichigo rips off his hollow mask and refuses the 
the assistance of his inner hollow, he gains the respect of Byakuya. He apologizes to him for the interruption. Byakuya realizes that Ichigo doesn't want to defeat him through using an external power which isn't his own. Towards the end of their battle, Byakuya starts to open up a little bit, as he admits that neither of them have much strength left. Before they clash for one final time, Ichigo insists on asking why isn't he trying to save Rukia. Unexpectedly, he tells Ichigo that if he can defeat him, then he will reveal to him the answer to his question. After their final clash in chapter 167, Byakuya finally reveals the reason as to why he didn't try to save Rukia. He says that those who break the law must face justice. They need to understandably face the consequences of their crimes. That is of course the meaning behind the law, but Ichigo asks just for the sake of the law he is going to kill his own sister, but Byakuya makes an important and mature distinction. He says that the bonds of his family mean nothing in the face of the law. He says that he is not going to give in to sentimental emotions. Even if the law is opposing one of his own family members, he says that the Kuchiki family is one of the four great noble families, and as its leader, they need to set an example for all Shinigami. If the Kuchiki family don't uphold the law of the Soul Society, then who will? Ichigo finds it difficult to relate to Byakuya's perspective, as he says that if he was in his shoes, then he would fight against the law in order to protect his own sister. These words cause Byakuya to be reminded of Kain Chiba, Rukia's former lieutenant who had passed away. He realizes that the enemy that Ichigo was fighting against was not Byakuya himself. This wasn't a personal battle. Ichigo has been fighting against the laws of the Soul Society in order to protect Rukia. This realization causes Byakuya to admit that Ichigo's persistence and his ferocity has won him the battle. He will no longer pursue Rukia as he humbly admits defeat against Ichigo. It doesn't take long for us to see a reformed version of Byakuya's character, as at the end of this Soul Society arc in chapter 1, 176, he saves Rukia's life by preventing Gin from killing her. At the end of the arc, he opens up his emotions to Rukia and reveals to her the truth about why she was adopted into the Kuchiki family. He speaks about the conflict which I mentioned earlier. After hearing that Rukia was going to be executed, he had difficulty choosing between the oath that he made to his parents or the promise that he made to Hisana to protect Rukia. He came to realize that supporting Rukia's execution was not the right thing to do, and he thanks Ichigo for making him come to this realization. During this early portion of the series, Byakuya's character facilitated Ichigo's growth, and it forced Ichigo to push himself to become stronger so that he may defeat Byakuya. Byakuya's character also motivates Renji's character to become stronger, for the very same reason. During this arc, both of them pushed themselves to their limits, and ultimately it was thanks to Byakuya's character who pushed both of them to become stronger and acquire Bankai. By the end of this arc, he no longer feels pride for himself. Instead, everybody around him becomes an extension of his pride. He is proud of both Rukia and Renji and thankful to Ichigo. Another notable change that occurs at the end of this arc is the respect that he begins to have for Ichigo. This is proven during his battle with Tsukishima in the Fallbrink arc. In chapter 473, he says that Tsukishima is Ichigo's enemy, and for that reason he will not hesitate in the slightest to kill him. At the beginning of his battle with Tsukishima, he says that he despises the way that he fights. He makes people forget the bonds and the relationships that they share with others, and he toys with his opponents, torturing them. Tsukishima does all of this from a distance, he doesn't even engage in battle. He believes that this is a coward's way of fighting, and it is for this reason Byakuya believes that the only punishment suitable for Tsukishima is death. Tsukishima's battle with Byakuya is an excellent pairing, as the two of them share a very similar demeanor. The two characters are both very calm and collected. As well as this, they do share somewhat of a resemblance with each other. In chapter 468, Tsukishima cuts Byakuya's Zanpakuto and inserts himself into his sword's memory. After having done this, he knows all of Byakuya's abilities and his techniques. Now that he is able to alter the past of his Zanpakuto, he will no longer be able to be cut by it. He also learns the weakness to Byakuya's Zanpakuto. Once he has scattered his blade petals, there is a protective area surrounding its user. This is the safe zone where the flower petals cannot breach. This prevents the caster of Zenbon Zakura from being injured by the blade petals. This weakness exists within Byakuya's Shikai and his Bankai, and now that he has cut Byakuya, none of his techniques will be able to work against Tsukishima, as he says that he has studied all of Byakuya's techniques and none of them will be effective against him, so Senke and Goke have been rendered useless. Despite Tsukishima having this overwhelming advantage over Byakuya, it doesn't seem to phase him. He activates his Bankai and reduces the range of his safe zone. He takes this opportunity to hold some of Zenbon Zakura's blades within his own hand, and when Tsukishima is caught off guard, he uses these blade petals to pierce Tsukishima through his chest. During these 17 months since the defeat of Aizen, Byakuya had been training, 
but all of the abilities and new techniques that he had acquired were useless against Tsukishima. Having to rely on his initiative, he comes up with an excellent method to take down Tsukishima. Byakuya is among one of the Shinigami who placed their Ryatsu into the sword that was prepared by Urahara, the one that Rukia used to restore Ichigo's powers. During the Fullbring arc, he assists Ichigo through helping to retain his powers and by defeating one of the Fullbringers. The same boy that he wanted to kill back in the Soul Society arc, he is now assisting and fighting alongside. In chapter 380, when Byakuya and Kimpachi arrive in Huekomundo to help Ichigo fight against Yami, Byakuya tells Ichigo to stay back. He tells Ichigo that there is nothing for him to do here in Huekomundo, and he tells him to go back to the world of the living where he is needed. When Ichigo insists that he needs to stay to help Byakuya and Kimpachi, and if all three of them work together, it would be easier to defeat the Espada, Byakuya reminds him of his duty. He reminds him that assisting the captains of the Gotai 13 is not his duty. They do not require help from a substitute Shinigami. Instead, Byakuya tells him that his duty is to defend Karakura Town, for he is the substitute Shinigami of Karakura Town. It isn't his job to clean up the mess in Huekomundo. That is the job of the Soul Society and the captains of the Gotai 13. And it is this moment that I always think back to whenever I go and read the Thousand Year Blood War arc, and in particular when I read chapter 512. When the Soul Society is ambushed and attacked by the Quincy, Byakuya faces off against the Sternritter Asnot. In this heartbreaking encounter, he has his Bankai stolen by the Sternritter, and for the first time in a long while, he makes Byakuya feel the sensation of fear. Asnot ultimately uses Byakuya's Bankai against him, and he brings forth the flower petals from Zenbon Zakura Kageyoshi, and he uses his own ability to tear apart Byakuya's body. He reminds Byakuya that there is nothing that he can do. He is not able to overcome his own Bankai with just his Shikai alone. In an attempt to protect Renji, who is angered by Asnot disrespecting Byakuya's Bankai, he diverts his attention away from Renji, but is once again attacked by his own blade petals. He is attacked by an endless storm of blade petals repeatedly. The attack is so overwhelming that it crashes Byakuya's body into a wall, forming a crater. After this devastating attack, he apologizes to both Rukia and Renji before passing out. When Ichigo finally arrives in the Soul Society in chapter 512, the first person that he meets is Byakuya. In what seems like his dying breath, he asks Ichigo if Rukia and Renji are still alive, to which Ichigo replies that they are. He is relieved to know that they are okay, and he tells Ichigo that he doesn't feel like he's going to last much longer. Byakuya is a character who gives a lot of importance to responsibility and duty, because throughout his life he upholded the responsibility of a captain of the Gotai 13. He relays to Ichigo his embarrassment that he could not take out those who attacked the Serite and he admits that he brought a lot of sorrow and suffering to all of the Shinigami that he led to their death during this invasion. He feels incredible shame that he is not able to avenge their deaths and he is deeply embarrassed because at the end of all of this, he has to rely on a human. He tells Ichigo that this isn't his fight to be involved in. And rightfully, it is not Ichigo's duty to be here in the first place. Back in the fake Karakura Town arc, he tells Ichigo that his duty was to protect Karakura Town, but now humbly asking for Ichigo's forgiveness for what he is about to ask of him, he requests that he please save the Soul Society. In my opinion, this was a really great send-off to Byakuya's character, and if he did die here, then I would have had no problems with it. Everything comes full circle in a kind of perfect way. The first major antagonist of the series, who even wanted to kill Ichigo himself, now has to rely upon him in order to save the Soul Society that he cherishes so much. If you want more of a detailed conversation on whether or not Byakuya should have died during the Thousand Year Blood War arc or not, then check out a video from my friend called Clyde, who discusses why he thinks Byakuya should have died. It's a great watch and I agree with a lot of the points that he makes, and I highly recommend it after this video. After the first Quincy invasion, it is reported that Byakuya has narrowly escaped death, but he is in a comatose state, and the only way that he can recover is if he is taken with the royal guards to their palace. Along with Rukia, Renji, and Ichigo, he is taken to the royal palace where his injuries are healed. If he had not been taken there, then he would have died. In chapter 545, Byakuya is finally healed, as he takes the longest to recover from his injuries. After being completely healed, he spends his time training with the royal guard. His desire is to reach a level where he can justify the pride that he felt prior to being defeated. In chapter 568, he rejoins the battle against the Quincy's, as he arrives to save Rukia while she is being overwhelmed by Asnot's ability, causing her to feel fear. He cuts through Asnot's wall of fear-inducing eyes. The Stenritter mocks Byakuya for his prior defeat. Thanks to Asnot stealing his Bankai, Byakuya was able to re-evaluate his abilities. He was put in a position where he was forced to reassess his Zanpakuto. His power has increased to such a level that his Shikai now resembles his Bankai. During this encounter, Byakuya's relationship with Rukia is expanded upon. He says that on his way to a sister, he had been feeling her spiritual pressure and he could tell that Rukia had become stronger. This acknowledgement from her brother means a lot to her. 
She had always looked up to him, but he didn't acknowledge her. You can clearly see the growth in Byakuya's character. He's able to freely express his emotions without holding back, and this has a positive effect on the relationships that he has with others. And in this case, him sharing his emotions has deeply impacted Rukia. He tells her that fear is born through the insecurities that we hold within our hearts. So he asks her if she still has any fears within her heart, and Rukia replies that she doesn't. He tells her that she will be the one who will defeat Asnot. He reassures Rukia that she is not the one who is afraid, instead it is Asnot who is the one who is fearful. His encouragement leads to the revelation that Rukia has attained Bankai. By utilising her Bankai, she is able to defeat Asnot, and the two of them go on to assist the other Shinigami and protect the Soul Society. During the latter portion of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Byakuya arrives in the royal palace that has been taken over by the Quincy. He teams up with Captain Hitsugaya and together they battle the Sternota Gerard. I always compare this pair up to Byakuya teaming up with Kimpachi in the Fate Karakura Town arc. When he was paired up with Kimpachi, the two of them had a lot of disagreements. Despite them having a dysfunctional relationship, they were still able to defeat the Espada that challenged them in Huekamundo. It doesn't take long for Kimpachi to arrive to assist Hitsugaya and Byakuya against Gerard. In chapter 674, Rukia and Renji try to assist Byakuya, but he tells them that they need to go to where Ichigo is. He tells them that they need to help him because he has already started his confrontation with Yuhabak. The help is not needed to fight against Gerard. After they leave, Hitsugaya speaks to him. He tells Hitsugaya that he chose his words carefully so that Rukia and Renji would understand the underlying meaning behind them. Upon first inspection, his words may seem really harsh, but the underlying meaning is that he wants them to go and help their friend. And Hitsugaya affirms this as he tells Byakuya that this is what they learned in the Shinigami Academy. He says that Shinigami are not taught to fight for their superiors or for their families. The true purpose of a Shinigami is to die protecting their friends and to give their life for the humans. They agree that Ichigo is only a comrade to them, but to Rukia and Renji, Ichigo is their friend. This emphasizes that Byakuya made the right decision to send Rukia and Renji to go and assist Ichigo. This moment that occurs right at the end of the manga shows how far Byakuya has come as a character. We see a clear change in his opinion of Ichigo and his relationship with Rukia and Renji has improved considerably. Initially, he considered Ichigo an enemy of the Soul Society and its law and order, but now he considers Ichigo as a true ally. This boy that he initially desired to kill eventually overwhelms him with his own power and opens his eyes, making him realise that he was in the wrong for supporting the execution of his sister. After that battle, Ichigo's resolve impacts Byakuya's character, and as we have seen throughout this video, Byakuya's opinion of Ichigo is incredibly high. He holds a lot of respect for him. It is because of this respect that he has for Ichigo Ichigo, he is able to embarrassingly ask him to save the Soul Society on his behalf. He feels incredible shame to ask Ichigo, but he has confidence in his abilities. He entrusts the Soul Society to someone who he prior thought was disrespecting the Soul Society when Ichigo disrupted Rukia's execution and opposed the decision of the Soul Society to execute her. Byakuya is a very well written character and he is one of my favourite characters within Bleach. I have really enjoyed reading through all of the moments that he appears in during the manga. It is incredibly fun to read through all of his battles, as his abilities are very unique and interesting. As well as this, seeing his transformation from someone who holds his emotions to himself, becoming more open and understanding is very rewarding. What are your thoughts on the head of the Kuchki family? Do you agree with me that he is one of the best characters within Bleach? Do you think that he should have been killed during the Thousand Year Blood War arc? I would love to hear your thoughts on his character in the comments down below. But before you click off of this video, I do need your help. If you've made it to the end of this video and you've enjoyed it in some way, then please do help the channel out by subscribing. As of making this video, 83% of the people that watch my channel are not subscribed to it, so it helps me more than you'll know by subscribing and turning on the bell notifications. Through subscribing, you're supporting the channel and guaranteeing that I can make more long-form videos like this one for the future. So please support the channel by helping me to reduce this percentage of 83% who are not subscribed to the channel. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, then please consider supporting my channel on Patreon. I have multiple tiers with the rewards including access to an exclusive Discord server, video scripts, as well as being the first to know about unreleased upcoming videos. Thank you for your time and whatever you choose to contribute, I will appreciate and it will mean a lot to me.